Hello and welcome to this webinar from Product Focus. Uh, my name is Eddie Pratt. I'm the Managing Director here. I'm delighted to introduce our guest presenter today, uh, Cyril LaRue, who will be giving you uh, a fantastic presentation on strategic prioritization. Over to you, Cyril. Thank you, Eddie. So good morning, good afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And a very warm welcome to this uh, webinar on strategic prioritization. And, you know, this one is really close to my heart because the subtitle could be things I wish I was told about prioritization at the beginning of my career. So let's jump uh, into it. Um, I'm Cyril. I'm going to be your host. I'm a senior consultant at uh, Product Focus. And in this webinar, there's going to be three parts. Uh, first, we're going to have a brief intro of Product Focus. We're then going to discuss strategic prioritization. So we'll start with uh, preconditions, the models of prioritization, and how to get reliable inputs. And then there will be a Q&A at the end. So who are we? Well, we're proud to say that we're the leading product management organization in uh, training organization in, in Europe. And we've been operating since 2006, it's been almost uh, 18 years. And we offer world-class trainings on two courses, one is product management, product marketing for technology-based products. This one is open to everyone. And there's another one, which is leading product management. And this is for, we have two uh, variants, one for experienced product people who are currently leading product teams, and another one for experienced product managers who aspire to be leading teams. Interestingly, this webinar contains extracts from both courses. Uh, we offer training courses either online or face-to-face, -face, and we can also deliver them either as public training courses or private. And the advantage of private is that it will put everyone in your team on the same page, and it will be customized to your uh, industry. And as a, a tribute to uh, the quality of our training, we're happy to report that we have an excellent uh, trust pilot score. And um, we have a number of other things that we can offer you as European thought leaders. We have a lot of free content accessible from our website. We have over 26,000 readers uh, signed up to our resources and they get journals, infographics, white papers, free content that gets unlocked uh, every week. All right, enough about the plug, right? Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the core content of the webinar. So I'm um, uh, Cyril, I've got about 20 years of experience in product management, the last 10 of which I spent in various leadership positions. And when I'm not training, I'm helping product organizations transform and adopt the product operating model. I've got experience across marketplaces, across uh, e-commerce, fintech, and, uh, and telecoms. Right, now, prioritization. It's easy, right? Well, you would think that all that requires is find enough room for a new feature and then pick the right one. Well, unfortunately not. As product managers, we can immediately see the problem there, correct? Who in their right mind would come up with their, uh, this kind of uh, monstrosity? And before you say no one, or well, here's an example. These two remotes, were released around the same time in 2010. They are both for set-top boxes, and yet, as you can see, they can be more different. The team on the left, you know, probably wasn't done yet. What you can't see on this image is that there's more free space on the underside. So you could flip it, and maybe you can add a trackpad, or maybe let's imagine a fingerprint sensor to load user preferences. I mean, clearly we can see that the team on the left gave up making choices a long time ago and kind of threw everything at it just in case. I mean, just in case somebody might need to hit the thumb, the thumb up uh, button in the, in the middle of a movie. Well, let's have a button for that. I mean, we can see that when everything is equally important, well, obviously nothing is, and you end up with a, a confused, uh, complicated, and focused product. And at that point, no matter how good is your team of user experience designers, there isn't really much they can do. So how do we avoid ending up like the product on the left and we end up with 
the Apple product on the right. Well, prioritization, you could say, comes from focus, and focus is largely subtractive. It's a little bit like carving a sculpture. You remove the material until it looks like what you intended. And you may have heard the phrase, uh, focus is about saying no. Steve Jobs may not be the first person who to have said it, but he definitely made it famous. And it's interesting to look at the context in which he made it famous. You can find the video on YouTube. You look for WWDC 97. Um, interestingly, that was 13 years before they came up with the remote on the previous slide. And the context of, um, of his, uh, his comment about focus is about saying no was because he was asked a question about OpenDoc. Now, OpenDoc was a great idea. It was a framework for office documents that was created by Apple, and it was there to facilitate integrating lots of different types of uh, components into a single document. So you would have a spreadsheet, you have presentation and, and anything else. And the vision for this product was quite good because over time you could imagine having some sort of a, an app store of all sorts of different little clever things you could do within the office suite. But Apple was running out of money at the time. So he canceled the whole thing quite spectacularly. And when somebody said, what about uh, open dock, he said, well, focus is about saying no. So the lesson here for us is that prioritization is not just about the order in which we're doing things, but it's also accepting that some things may never be done, and that's okay. Uh, I mean, we cannot just keep adding ideas to the backlog every time we get one. It dilutes the focus, it makes the backlog much more difficult to manage because there's a ton of random ideas at the bottom that don't really fit any particular direction, but we don't want to lose them. We might need them someday. So what we're going to do now is think about the basic ingredients to be able to have strategic prioritization. And this is even before you start listing the candidates. So this is how you know how, what to accept. You have a number of filters and the first two filters that you need are strategy and governance. Now the context for this slide is multiple teams within the same company. We'll have another slide immediately after to focus on, on startups. At the top here, you have the company vision and strategy. Now, that is usually useful, but it's very high level. So it's useful, but not for immediate product prioritization. In many organizations, you will have teams organized in tribes or portfolio, and each tribe or portfolio will also have a vision and a strategy at that level. And then comes the interesting bit. It's the governance. Governance is an agreement for how much should be invested into each area. So let's look at the buckets. The first bucket here is keeping the lights on. Uh, this is about tech debt. It's about preventive maintenance. Then you have customer funded roadmap. If you're in B2C, that probably does not apply. But in B2B, in some cases, you will have customers paying the team to add features that they need. Then you have the company funded roadmap, which is what drives into the company vision. And then you will use also, you will also have some allocation for disruptive innovation. So why is that useful? Well, once you've decided which percentage of your resources go in each bucket, it makes everything a lot simpler because we're always under a lot of pressure. There's a big flow of great ideas coming from sales, coming from customer service, coming from technical leaders. And of course, we also need to maintain the tech debt. With so many different things, how do you pick? Well, you give each their own lane. And if, for instance, you've given 20% of your resource and you've agreed this with your leadership, you see, this is, this is something that you need to agree with your, uh, your manager. Well, if you've alloc allocated 20% to keeping the lights on, protect that and preventive maintenance, well, you're no longer in that situation where you need to prioritize 
we factoring an API because it's getting it's getting uh, deprecated with other tech items and perhaps an SEO thing and perhaps even a KPI driving initiative. So it's impossible when you think about it. How do you prioritize refactoring an API with improving the conversion rate by one percentage point, for instance? It's, it's very, very hard. So when you agree upfront to have buckets, then it ensures that you have those constraints to provide you with a balanced investment and makes a lot of your life a lot easier because then all the tech debt gets prioritized against tech debt and, and so on. If you don't do that and you're trying to create a high level roadmap, it's a little bit like trying to fill a small bucket with a fire hose, right? It's, it's very frustrating. So that acts as a first first filter, first uh, way of uh, prioritizing, and then you will need your product vision and strategy. And this will be kind of your third filter. It's very important to have a strong vision for your product. You will have one for the company and one ideally have for, you will have one as well for the portfolio, but having a strong product vision is very important to carve out all the things that are not part of the end vision. So let me ask you this. If you're a product manager in a team right now, do you have a vision for how your team is driving company success? Well, it's important to, to think about that. Now, maybe you're not in a multi-team company, but you're in a, in a single team, you're in a startup. The same key components are going to be in place, but it's going to be a little bit different. There's no need for a separate product strategy and product vision, because if you only have one team, the company vision and company strategy is the vision for you. What may happen, however, is that the vision may not be strong enough to guide the product. And as a product manager, you may feel that uh, you should help refine it, and that would be perfectly okay. What are some good examples or bad examples of a uh, vision <clears throat> to help you gauge whether it is useful or not? Well, a vision is literally something you can envision. You can imagine it. So imagine the vision is the best consumer company in the universe. Well, it's not easy to imagine, is it? What does that mean? It could mean a lot of different things. It's, not, it's, it's very fluffy. So you need to make it a bit more precise. A good vision is the one that uh, Microsoft was using in the 80s uh, as part of their orientation video for new employees. It's, it's brilliant, it's very simple. It says, a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. You can immediately imagine what it looks like and it helps you drive the product in the right direction. All right, so now you have a product vision that helps you define what needs to be done. That is at product level. Uh, you have agreed investment buckets with your leadership. Now you still need to prioritize within each bucket. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at uh, a few different uh, models. And the first one is Moscow. Um, that model was developed in the 90s by a product manager, believe it. Uh, he was called, uh, he's called Day Clegg. And uh, he was working in Oracle at the time on uh, rapid uh, application development. Now, for it to work, obviously, it needs to be time bound. And you will note that there is no prioritization within the must. Um, I mean, clearly, the product is not usable until all the elements of the must uh, uh, bucket are, are delivered. So you could say that is, this is potentially your MVP. Then you have in should, what's important, but not critical, and then could, could help you differentiate. But what I really like about this model is that it's very explicit about what will not be there, at least not in the next release. So what are the good and, and bad thing about this model? Well, it's easy to understand, it's flexible, and it's explicit about what's not going to be there, but, it is potentially subjective as a way of categorizing because you don't really have explicit criteria here. And also you don't have any prioritization within should or could, probably because you don't know. So this is 
this is a good use case for an MVP when you have no data, really, you have little feedback, you perhaps have a little bit of qualitative insight from customers, but you know, you're going to embrace the subjectivity of it. And then when you have a more robust uh, set of data, then you can move to another model, uh, like for instance, RICE. RICE was invented by Intercom. Uh, it's a formula that multiplies reach, impact and confidence and divides all of that by the effort. So how do you fill it? Well, reach, you get to pick the unit there. You could, uh, you could use customers, you could use sessions. The point in, uh, in reach is that you need to limit it to the scenarios where customers will be able to see that particular experience. So if you only have 5% of your customers going through checkout, then the, the reach will not going to be the whole audience uh, on your website, only those who go through your checkout. Then you have impact and you will see that this is often misused because you will see a lot of different ratings on impact, but the original model only has five options. Uh, three, two, one, 0 0.5 and 0 0.25. And uh, I was reading um, uh, a post on LinkedIn recently where somebody was suggesting actually it works even better when you go uh, logarithmic so that it's uh, above it's one, 10 and 100. And the reason is because it increases the distance between the results. It makes it a lot easier to pick. And then you have confidence. Again, confidence, you shouldn't be picking any number between you know, zero and 100. You have three values that they're suggesting you use, 50, 80, or 100. I mean, it starts at 50, obviously, because if there's less than 50% chance that it will improve your KPIs or it will improve your impact, then you, know, you shouldn't be doing it. And finally, the effort here is um, in person month, but you could use something else. What's interesting here is that it gets you a little bit closer to strategy because impact is obviously going to be against your strategy. That's the yardstick here. So you need to decide and, and, and evaluate for yourself how much is that going to drive your strategy. So pros and cons again, it's data informed, comprehensive, transparent, and, and flexible. It's a bit more complex to put in place. Sometimes people say it undervalue projects that are a little bit harder to quantify in benefits because you know the confidence will be lower, uh, but that's that's essentially the point. Uh, and it is still subjective. Let's be honest. Reach is not the result of a formula. It's 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 things that you've uh, you've calculated. Now, the next model, after you've done that, so um, uh, rice is when you have data informed. Uh, performance optimization. The next model is when you have mostly consumer insight. It comes from Professor Noriaki Kano of Tokyo University, and uh, it suggests to group requirements in six categories uh, based on two questions only. Now, the first question is, how would you feel if the requirement is fulfilled? And how would you feel if the requirement is not fulfilled? So let's take an example and see how it works. Um, let's imagine that uh, we're in the context of a hotel experience. How would you feel if this requirement is fulfilled? For instance, you get a mini bar, a free mini bar. It was not in the brochure. It's kind of a surprise. You get there and, you know, wonderful. There's a free mini bar. Now, some of you uh, will love that. Maybe not everyone, but I would definitely. So I'm going to like it. I'm going to be on, on that line there. What did I expect? Well, I did not expect it. So uh, how do you feel if the requirement is not fulfilled? Well, I'm, I'm not. I'm expecting not to be there. So I'm going to be here as an exciter. Now, let's take an, another example. I'm in the same hotel. I'm checking in. And uh, the person checking me in is very excited to tell me that there is a lock on the door. And frankly, I expected there would be a lock on the door. And if there's no lock on the door, well, the least I can say is I'm not gonna like it. Uh, and that makes it a must have requirement. And then you have a number of other requirements where you know you like it if it's there, you dislike it if it's not there, but it's, it's not gonna be a deal breaker. So this is where you know competitors will start. Some of them will have it or not. It will often depend on how much money you're putting in there. So if you're going to a hotel, uh, a holiday hotel, 
for instance, you know, the size of the pool will often be a factor of how much you've uh, you spent. Um, so priorities here, you would have first the must haves, then valued, then the exciters. Now you note there are a few other categories here. You have the value of indifference here. These are requirements that really don't really move the dial much. So you should not invest into those at the moment. But you also have requirements that are undesired. Um, those undesired requirements, for instance, if you're not a particularly um, uh, geek kind of person, you don't really like technology that much, uh, you like buttons, you like simple things, and you walk into your hotel room, and the only way to control the TV, the lights, the blinds, the temperature is to use a very high-tech looking tablet, then some people might not like it. So the other lesson here is that it's very dependent on your segment and uh, what they would like or not like. So to operationalize this, I mean, you can see how the the answer that places you in the particular part of the matrix puts you somewhere in the uh, in the graph there, and um, there's a few lessons that uh, we need to uh, we need to remember when um, uh, we're going through this. First of all, is that the requirements evolve all the time. What used to be uh, an exciter may all the time become more of a valued uh, requirement. You should also be worried about experience rot. It's when you keep adding exciters up to a point where you're getting to a point where it's actually very challenging to, uh, to use. Um, and, and another lesson is that, uh, well, you can't swap a must have for an exciter. This is kind of implicit, but sometimes when you present information that way, people misunderstand and think that, okay, there's this must have we can't have, but if we throw two exciters, it's going to work. And it's like, you know, you get free mini bar, a large pool, but no lock on the door. Would you still go in that hotel? I know a lot of people who would not. So when can you use this model? Well, when you have rich qualitative consumer or customer insight, uh, it's also useful when you're expanding to a new market. You want to check that uh, the expectations of the new market is the same as the, uh, as the old one. And it's also one because it's really customer, customer centric that can be used as a, um, as, as a first stage to uh, gauge the value and, uh, and, and use as an input to um, other models. So it's user insight driven, that's the pros. Uh, there's a bit less granularity. You don't have granularity within each of the, of the buckets uh, and uh, it might actually lead to neglect and must have if it's done incorrectly. Right, the next model is great for annual planning. It's a model where you plan, you look at value versus uh, complexity. This is a very simple one that you've, you've probably already seen before. Now, in itself, it doesn't tell you uh, what to prioritize, but it helps visualizing the option. And clearly, I mean, we've all heard of that uh, quick wins or low hanging fruits. This is where we're gonna go first, right? Um, so it helps understand where you're gonna spend your money um, and uh, it will uh, highlight that you have major projects that, that need to be done and perhaps things here that have, uh, uh, sorry, the FanClex task here, here have low value, high complexity. Maybe those are the ones that should be uh, pushed to, uh, to later. But again, when you're doing value, if you're doing strategic prioritization, the value is not taken random or, uh, or subjectively and needs to follow your strategic objectives. There's um, one last model that uh, uh, we can look at. It's a model I really like. It's the weighted scorecard. Uh, and this works great when you have strategic pillars to improve things like conversion rate, grow organic traffic or open new markets. You know, they will have this as, as strategic pillars for the, for the whole year. And what you can do is give a rating to each of those uh, pillars, and then you score each of the initiatives based on how much they drive that pillar. And by multiplying the score by uh, the weight, you can add them up and you get a value score. Now, the trick for this one to work well is to have an equivalence where if you have a one, 
on the right hand side and the one on the left hand side, that means they're value and cost neutral. The value, the cost um, balance each other out. Meaning if you do it that way, then anything that is below one will actually not be aligned with the current strategy. Now note, it doesn't mean it's a bad idea. You probably have great ideas in there, but they do not, they are not aligned with the current strategy and therefore they should not be done. So that, uh, that approach is, uh, is very useful. And um, uh, if you have OKRs, for instance, and different things that need to be driven through the OKRs, well, you can see how the whole thing works well together. Because one of the issues we have when we're doing OKR is that we wrongly assume that we're going to have the whole capacity of the team to drive OKR. Well, we don't. Most of the time, we still need to keep the lights on. We're still going to have interruptions. And we'll still are going to be doing some 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 experiments, hopefully. So this, first of all, with uh, when combined with the buckets in your KRs, you realize that you only really have half the capacity, and then you can decide how you're going to use that uh, complexity. So pros and cons: pros it drives strategic alignment, reduces subjectivity and bias. Uh, I said reduce; it doesn't take it out completely because it's still a rating that you're you're uh, guessing. Uh, and it's comprehensive, it's a little bit more complex to set up, but uh, in our toolbox, we have those uh, templates if you want to, uh, to use them. Now, you would think that we're doing pretty well if we're doing that far, but there would still be uh, potentially a problem. Sorry, this one is about uh, uh, a summary. I'm gonna leave the slide here for you to download later to explain where can each of those uh, framework be, uh, be used. But the problem I wanted to talk about is this, garbage in, garbage out. And often when I'm coaching teams, one of the things I realize or that, that I see pretty early on is that prioritization is done on the basis of a double guess. We're guessing the value and we're guessing the cost or the effort. And um, often we're wrong <laughs> and often we're wrong on both of them and uh, it goes south from there. So we need something a little bit more robust and a good way of dealing with this is to put in place a dual track agile, where you decide to allocate part of your resources to discovery. And when you take a product through discovery, you will look at particular areas of risk. Now, this concept comes from Marty Kagan in his book, uh, Inspired, and where he details all the different things you could use. But Generally, value, feasibility, usability, and viability are the key ones. Uh, sometimes you could add ethics, for instance, but uh, for, uh, to stay simple, value is something potentially you could measure with a, a conversion rate experiment with a, a painted or a fake door, for instance, on a very small percentage because fake doors, they can be annoying with users. So don't do that on the full traffic of your site or your app. But uh, uh, an interview with customers uh, following, for instance, the mom test from uh, Rob Fitzpatrick could, could give you that sort of insight as well, whether it's valued by customers. Uh, feasibility, this is where you're going to let your engineering team come up with a prototype that can end up being thrown away because at the end of doing that prototype, they realize how they should build it in the first place. So when you're in that situation where, you know, the engineering is is overrunning and it takes much longer than initially planned well sometimes because you know a feasibility up front and just accepting that could be throw away would have actually made the team pick the right choices earlier on usability is something you can measure with uh, things like uh, figma or sketch prototypes and then viability is finally when you have the operational model you've, you've put all the costs together and you know how much it's going to cost so you can use this to feed a weighted scorecard kind of uh, model, at the end of which you are confident that you can put it on the delivery track and you are much less at risk of being uh, very late or the uh, feature that uh, you're delivering not hitting the, uh, the impact that you were, you were hoping. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> The secret to strategic prioritization in product management, well, there's only a few things. You need to agree with your leadership, a strong vision that is going to be truly effective at uh, making roadmap choices. So something, you remember the good or bad vision, you need to 
help perhaps refine the vision. So that helps you do that. You need to have investment buckets. This is very important. Otherwise you're stuck with prioritizing things that cannot be prioritized against each other. So uh, they need to be done up front and agreed so that uh, each product or feature category or development category stays within its own lane. Then you need to pick one or more models to think through the priorities. Um, you will find a lot of other models out there. The point of this webinar was not to be extensive about all the models, but present some of the most useful ones. And then finally, to use dual track agile to avoid prioritizing based on a, a, a double guess. So that's it. As we said earlier, we have a lot of uh, free uh, resources that you can, uh, you can download from uh, our website. And uh, we'd also be delighted to uh, run some uh, training either for you as part of the public course or for your, your, your whole team, your whole company as a uh, private course. So at this point, it's time for Q&A. So Becca so, Jackson uh, asking, uh, could you offer some advice on what to do when there are product managers with no portfolio and no governance around the strategy other than we will pay X million a year for the team? Well, it's uh, yes, it's not a comfortable situation to be in, but this is where as a product leader, you can step up essentially. This is something that should be agreed with the leaders. Doesn't mean you need to wait for the leaders to do it. And in my experience, it doesn't actually happen often, especially when um, uh, product leaders perhaps have, have come from another, another line of work uh, and were not product managers themselves. So this is something that I would encourage you to try to do yourself and uh, start uh, discussing with your engineering team. First of all, what is the absolute minimum we need to invest on the tech debt side of things? Uh, and then looking at what the other buckets are, make a proposal, make a proposal on the vision, make a proposal on, on the strategy. And this will actually create a very collaborative environment and also explain how you make decisions. Because unless that is in place, you're going to have a lot of frustration when it comes to roadmap meetings, because there won't be anything explaining why the choices are done the way they are. All right. Uh, hopefully that helps. Any recommendation on how to reflect senior stakeholders' personal preferences, whether rational or not, in prioritization scoring? Yes, we've all had that, right? There's an extra column uh, that says, uh, CEO override, I want this. Well, I mean, CEOs are there for a reason. And, and as annoying as that sounds, often they're right. So they may not always be able to explain exactly where their hunch comes from, but they usually have an in-depth domain knowledge that where they've connected the dots and they know or they have a strong hunch about what's going to work and they cannot always articulate it. So I usually, you know, allow personally, I mean, it's not that you don't want to have a fight with the CEO anyway, but, you know, there are situations where you can give a number of tokens to your CEO, say, okay, you can have, you know, it could be a bucket. You have 20% of the roadmap to do whatever you want with it. Uh, and, and then they can prioritize within that. As long as this is done up front and, and, um, and, and discussed, again, you want to have enough to be able to justify the roadmap decisions that you're doing uh, later. Uh, Tony Banks is asking, how does a company decide the percentage breakdown uh, of the four pillars? What would be done annually as part of the company on product strategy and how do you come to the split? Well, that's gonna be a negotiation, uh, Tony. Uh, there is, unfortunately a tendency especially in small startups and um, uh, some later stage scale-ups to neglect the technical debt uh, and um, i've been in situations where I've, I've came across two companies where the tech debt had overrun so badly that it threatened the real uh, the, the, the future prospects of the company so this is something that you need to have the cto the engineering lead to really weigh in on I would say out of all the buckets, get the tech debt sorted first to make sure that you keep uh, your, your product alive. It's, it's life support, right? You can't really neglect that. You need oxygen, you need food, you need water. So that's what the, the, the need there. And then after that, it's a negotiation. If you're in B2B, well, it will depend on, uh, on, uh, on, on the uh, uh, 
uh, the demands of customers, if they have some. But you see, the byproduct will be, again, your prioritization will be clear. You will, if, if you know, the company wants 50% for customer funded roadmap, what well, clearly, if you add 20% to uh, the tech debt, you're only left with 30% to drive the company roadmap. Now expectations are set. If people are not happy with that, we can renegotiate or increase resources, but this is a way of discussing rather than presenting as a fait accompli. It's more of a conversation, a negotiation to explain the prioritization that are done in the roadmap uh, later. Uh, Laura is saying, I work in an organization with over 70 products while all PMs report through the same CPO. We tend to work in separate product groups. Is it reasonable, advisable for us all to aspire to use the same prioritization model? Uh, I would say probably not. Uh, I would say that each team, based on uh, its strategic direction and its vision, will be either working on things that are uh, way ahead of phase, where, for instance, we may not even have customers yet. We're creating new experiences. So you're more on the Cano side of things, on the Moscow side of things. Or you could be on the other side where some teams are purely about optimization and driving performance, in which case this is, would be more of a RICE kind of uh, prioritization or a similar model to RICE. I mean, there, there's a few variants that, that, that work really well. So you would use different, uh, different models based on the, uh, the, uh, where, where you are. Um, let me try to pick another one. Arjun is asking, in my opinion, which of these prioritization models is the most simple and straightforward for customers, stakeholders to understand? Well, not RICE or not um, weighted uh, scorecard. Those are the most complex one. Moscow works really well. As a, and it could be that you essentially do the prioritization with something a bit more complex, but then you present it with Moscow. And if they ask the reason why, well, you can, you can uh, explain it in, in more details how you came to that answer. But uh, those take a little bit longer to, uh, to understand. Uh, Cano is also a little bit more complex uh, to, uh, to explain. Uh, but on the other hand, value versus complexity, or to be honest, any other dimension, uh, instead of value or complexity, you could have you know, uh, effort or, or other revenue, other things that uh, uh, could, be, could be relevant. And mapping them out that way is also uh, can be helpful. Any advice for getting useful estimates from dev engineering teams without spending huge amounts of time of in making it another thing that needs to be on the roadmaps? That's James uh, Tate Smith asking this. Um, I think with engineering, you end up paying for it sooner or later. You either pay it up front, and it's in my experience, you would pay a little bit less if you let them experiment with tech, or you pressure them to you know make a choice and just go ahead with you know the first thing that comes through their mind in terms of architecture and then you know there's a risk further down the line the um what i sense perhaps as part of this question is that you may be in a situation where engineering tends to do their own thing and not be particularly collaborative and it could be that if you bring them up uh, in, a, in another model that is suggested by Marty Kagan, which is the, the trio at the top. At the top of the product team, you have a product manager, you have a, an engineering lead, uh, which is not necessarily an engineering manager, it's a, the, the, the top engineer working with a product manager and working with a product designer or UX or a BA. These three should make most of the decisions and should be in agreement with where you're headed. And when you approach it that way and you, uh, your engineering lead understands the constraint you have on the portfolio, has agreed uh, on how much goes into the different buckets, you would have normally a more collaborative uh, relationship. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Nelson is asking, how do you get buying to prioritization metrics when you don't agree on the scoring and lean toward fast decisions? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I've seen that happen as well. But again, there should be a clear line of sight between company vision, strategy, 
maybe portfolio tribe if there is one, and then your product vision strategy that then leads to prioritization. It could be that if there's no buying for prioritization metrics, there is no real buying for strategy. You know, everything is important, everything matters, and um, there's no alignment. So the alignment is one level up. If people don't agree on prioritization metrics, it's not on the prioritization matrix that you're going to solve it. You need to solve it a level above that. You need to solve it by discussing the bucket, discussing the strategy, agreeing the vision with the product leadership and get their support as well. So once you've agreed it with them, you need them to support you in enforcing it through the rest of the year. Um, after, so Yvonne is asking, after prioritization, after feature prioritization is set, what if the product team requests fully written story for the next six months for them to do their estimation? Now, Yvonne, I can see there is a safe level five in your, um, uh, in, in your title, which I suspect might be coming a little bit from there. There's a lot of debate around, uh, around safe and, and how conducive it is to product. I'm not going to go into that debate here. But um, uh, this doesn't feel, dare I use the word, very agile if you need to specify things six months in advance. And the way I would, arg I I would, I would argue is that agile is about reducing waste. It's about reducing waste on things that might change between the moment when you've done something and the moment when you've delivered uh, or you start working on something. And if you need to do things six months in advance, you need to really be sure you're not going to have to redo any of that work. Now, if there's absolute certainty that nothing is going to have to be redone, then, I mean, why not? Uh, it's going to take you a while, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I don't see that necessarily as, a, as an issue. And it's perhaps uh, something, again, to negotiate with your, uh, your engineering team. Uh, how many more, Eddie? I think we're about done there, Cyril. Yeah, very, very okay. well done. You've you've really uh, been put to the test there. <laughs> Fantastic job, Cyril. I mean, I've learned uh, a lot there as well, and you've made it super clear. And uh, just from the the various comments, I think uh, everybody's been enjoying this and has got lots of questions. So thank you, Cyril. Thank you to everyone who's joined That's us. Nice. So thank you, and uh, have a fantastic day. So we'll uh, end the webinar now. Thank you very much. Now, bye bye. Thanks,